My name is Darius Lind. I'm from Just Tech. I'm joined today by Anna Steele. Um, so today's training is on, or, or presentation is on leveraging technology to improve uh, supervision. Uh, so this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, prior to joining Just Tech, uh, I was an attorney at a legal services organization and I was a supervisor. So I spent a lot of time supervising. Um, and now I'm a senior consultant at Just Tech. Anna. And um, so my name is Anna Steele. I'm the director of consulting here at Just Tech. Um, prior to joining Just Tech, I was also at a legal aid organization. And um, for me, kind of why this, why I really want to talk about this today is um, on one side, right, Just Tech is a distributed uh, team. We have folks all over the country. And um, I wanted to make sure, uh, and this is something that we're using regularly and talking about regularly, right? How we can best use technology to um, kind of work together and as a supervisor, how I can uh, supervise the folks on my team by using technology. And then also the work that uh, we're doing with legal aid providers around the country, right? And, and looking at what folks have been doing and uh, has been working really well throughout the community and kind of translating that into this um, presentation today. So uh, the kind of techniques that we're talking about today are both um, from our own experiences and experiences of folks that we've worked with and um, hoping that folks will find um, this useful. If you have any questions, feel free to enter them in uh, to the questions box in GoToWebinar and uh, SART will help facilitate those throughout. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to say that I, I think is interesting about this type of topic is that <clears throat> I think it helps us bridge a little bit of the gap. Uh, and like I said, I was I was a practicing attorney at a legal services organization. And sometimes, not always, and not with every program, there is a sort of a, a separation. So on one hand, we have our case handlers who are just, we're just trying to handle cases. And then we, we you know, for most, almost every organization has a technology team or works with technology providers. And sometimes those, those uh, processes are working in parallel and they're, they're supporting each other, but they don't necessarily integrate. And so what I like to think about is how can we maximize and integrate those experiences so that we can get a better outcome. That's sort of the other uh, sort of a twining of my two backgrounds here. So again, from the legal side of it, I was thinking about the, this topic in terms of uh, outlining the case for using technology and supervision, right? So we have a professional and ethical obligation to supervise. Um, it's not just that, you know, we, we want to be good supervisors, but we, we have to. Uh, and if our hope today of what we can ex sort of outline is some ways that we can start looking at technology that we use already, that we could be using with, you know, relatively simple adaptations or changes uh, and think about ways that it can help us improve the supervision that we're doing and improve sort of the organizational structure that a lot of the supervision uh, functions in. So um, I sort of started to outline this, this sort of the places that our obligations come from to be good supervisors. Um, so we have a professional obligation to do this. Um, as a supervisor, I, I want, you know, I care about the work that I do. I care about the work that people working uh, with me and around me are doing. But, you know, I think if we do a, a good job, we also have to be thinking about these bullet points here, right? How are we passing along the institutional knowledge from our organization? So all of uh, the people that we, Anna and I see in our work and um, that I saw when I was practicing were, you know, there's these organizations that have tremendous years and years of experience. Sometimes uh, how we communicate what uh, people in the organization, organization know and how we share that knowledge can be challenging because it's not as easy as sitting down and uh, having a conversation. And sometimes we, we can, uh, in, in this environment, we can find some tools to bridge those gaps. Um, another sort of part of our professional obligation is to improve those outcomes on cases. So I want to make, it's really important <laughs> that uh, 
we are not just putting people in roles where they do the work, but that we're giving them the best tools to succeed. Um, another good or reason that we need to be looking at supervision is that we need to build relationships that are uh, meaningful with the people that we work with. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends. It doesn't mean you have to even talk all the time, but we do have to have a strong relationship. So that, you know, moving to the next couple points here, that uh, we're making sure that we have best practices. We're making sure that people are um, handling cases the way we as an organization or as supervisors believe they should be handled. And that if or when something isn't working the way it should be, either in a supervision relationship or even just something went wrong, right? Somebody's not available, there's an emergency, that we have the structures in place to um, understand what's, what's going on, why it happened, why something uh, is going sideways, and that we have a plan or we can implement a plan. And that's where the technology piece uh, comes in, that we can uh, more quickly identify issues and more quickly uh, plan for solutions. Um, and so the final uh, point, and it kind of goes back to the point at the top, is uh, continuity. So we have a lot of institutional knowledge. We have uh, some people who are experts in their field, who have a really good skill set. And the more we can sort of spend time looking at why people are successful, how they've acquired their knowledge, how, and identify ways that they can share their knowledge uh, to the extent that we want to improve that, we can foster and encourage uh, better continuity. And that means better outcomes for our clients and more stability for organizations. So beyond a professional obligation, uh, when I was supervising, this is sort of where I started. Now, every there's a sort of a note at the bottom. Every state obviously has their own rules of professional conduct. But it was ingrained into me when I started that when I supervise people, and I ingrained into them as well, that I, the people I supervise, it's not just a question of uh, their sort of professional license. It's a question of mine too. So as someone doing a work, uh, my supervisor needs to is is on the hook for the professional ethical work that I do. And, uh, and then as a supervisor, right, the people that I supervise, if they do something, you know, that violates any professional rules of, of conduct, uh, I'm on the hook. And I think that's, you know, when at least working with uh, on the legal side of, of the work in legal services, uh, that's about as serious of an incentive as there is. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really important that we understand our obligations, that we don't just sort of point people in the direction of a courthouse or a, or a client and tell them to, you know, check in with me next week, but that we make sure that they understand what's going on. <clears throat> this goes a little bit back to the professional obligations that we orient them, but also that, that we, we put people in a position to succeed because if we're not doing that, uh, we are at risk of violating our ethical obligations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then on the next level, we have an organizational obligation. So um, I was sort of spending some time looking at like where uh, these ethical obligations have filtered up to organizations. And I was looking at the LSE performance criteria, which uh, outline, or, this item here that we're looking at, effective supervision of legal work, uh, which includes regular and detailed supervisory review of cases. That's, that's an indicator of a program meeting their success. So if you pair that with what the ABA standards are for uh, use of technology, which is that technology uh, should be uh, implemented in a way that increases the e efficiency of uh, internal operations. I think if we look at those two factors, um, beyond the the professional and uh, ethical obligations, I think as an organization, there is an uh, there is an obligation to develop and uh, implement technology in uh, into supervision standards and protocols. So that's 
that's the, those are like the frameworks that I think we're operating in when we're thinking about why we need to get better at this, right? So I I then sort of started thinking about well, what is what's the pitch, right? Because um, why why do people why should people go about uh, adding new processes, adding new or changing their jobs um, beyond those obligations? Uh, how do we convince the people that uh, we need to go talk to that they need they need to to change their what they're doing? So uh, these are sort of the talking points that that I was thinking about. I think the bottom line is that we're not trying to add work to what they're doing. Um, a lot of what we think about when we're trying to improve supervision is to look at what already exists, right? What frameworks. Uh, processes to go to the next point are, are in place and and really it's about adjusting some of those processes uh, adjusting some of those technologies that we're using to help us uh, make supervision a little bit more easily done you know we have the opportunity now with better technologies to automate some of these processes as we'll talk about later uh, to make the job essentially make it easier um, I think the, the the key point I wanted to make sort of in this preamble is that um, you're not going to use a technology tool to make somebody a good supervisor, right? So uh, that is a, a personal project. People can become good supervisors through training, through work. You're not going to uh, you know, purchase some sort of application that's going to suddenly make someone a supervisor. But what we can do is help get people the information that they need to make those decisions, to make uh, choices that are going to foster better supervision. So turning towards uh, sort of some of the specific applications, um, Ann and I are looking at today two different ways that we can uh, start to utilize technologies that we have or could have in our organizations to meet these obligations that I'm talking about. So the, the first part of this process, I think, is looking at uh, case management systems and other systems that we have and, and the data around it and uh, optimizing that. The other is using some of that information we get from the first part of the, uh, this presentation and other tools that we have available to um, give folks more flexibility and give supervisors other tools to uh, keep, I wouldn't say keep an eye on, but uh, supervise and uh, monitor work that's being done. Um, so first sort of subtopic is data as a supervision tool and i'm going to turn it over to anna for this conversation great this thanks darius Thank you. and so um yeah right i think darius um set the context really well um for this right and the first step is um is data so if you want to go to the next slide mm -hmm. um right so why does this matter i think that Darius got into that really well. So how can we make this work? Um, I think, you know, most if not all of us are using case management systems, whether it is an access database or are doing some sort of case management, right, whether you're using an access database or a full-fledged case management system um, like Legal Server or PICA, um, we have a ton of data in there, right? We also have data in other systems. Um, I'll talk a little bit about phone systems and, and the way we manage documents as well. Um, but how do we, how do we, um, we have the, the information we need and now we just need to figure out kind of how to, how to manipulate it. And I think it's important to uh, just remember that the data points us toward answers. It's not necessarily going to give us the answer, right? It is not a crystal ball. It is not, uh, the data is not something that we can just um, look at once and make all sorts of conclusions based off of, right? It's, it's a piece of the puzzle. Um, and can help uh, point us towards what we what we want to do. And I think one thing to kind of keep in mind throughout this is that 
we're, we definitely don't want people using data strictly as a gotcha, right? We don't necessarily want to be using it just for finding underperformance or just for finding overperformance, right? We want to use it to help get a full picture of uh, what's going on in the unit you supervise or in the office you supervise or the organization you supervise um, and be able to um, not only make sure that people are working at the top of their practice, but also make sure that um, the work that folks are doing actually aligns with the uh, strategic plan of the organization or the uh, goals of the organization or the grant obligations of the organization. Um, so this is just kind of giving us a little bit more of that feedback. Yeah, and if I could piggyback on it, I think uh, a little bit when we're looking at legacy data in case management systems and trying to sort of inform supervision and best practices, I, I think it's almost a little bit of a third rail that you have to be really careful with, right? I mean, we're not, It's and it's important to emphasize this is, it shouldn't really be used. I mean, I guess organizationally you can decide this, but like our point is not that it should be used for, for that gotcha analysis, but rather that we can plan a little bit better if we understand the casework that's going on and we can identify uh, places to improve both by looking at successes and looking at uh, things we want to do better. But I, I, I almost think that on an individual basis it's, a, it's probably less helpful than it is on a large scale basis. Um, I know that and I'm just going to switch to the next slide here. But I know that like with case management systems, we have, let's say, tw 20 years of data. A lot of programs have at least. Um, so you're not really looking at like what an individual's work might be, but more like what do we know about our organization and how it does this type of work? I think that's tremendously informative. Yes, yes, definitely. And I think right that uh, the LSC-funded folks on the call today, right, this is all very much baked into um, just general operations, right? Case management systems are second nature to um, all LSC programs, and I imagine many, many uh, of the other providers out there as well. But the requirement to have these case management systems lays the groundwork really nicely. So when we look at... Um, the case management systems, right, just because we have one doesn't mean that we are fully leveraging it for supervision purposes, right? So uh, places that we want to think about having uh, either policies or uh, robust development in our case management system include timekeeping or ways to keep um, records in a case, whether that is for um, like your day-to-day -day timekeeping or only fee generating or cases or attorney's fees. Right, so um, a there's many organizations are keeping regular time, right, and that is a treasure, tr treasure trove of information as far as supervision goes. Um, ticklers are minders in calendaring, right. Again, there's a lot of great information that can be pulled out of the uh, tasks and deadlines that people are setting for themselves. And so, and while obviously a lot of this information can be found in folks' calendar, Outlook Calendar or uh, Google Calendar, right? Uh, being able to leverage the case management system to be able to aggregate some of that data can be uh, really useful as well. SMS messaging and other communications, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but making sure that, um, again, if you're using your case management system as a way to communicate with clients or other staff members, um, that, that, that we have really good data, even if that data is just the text messages themselves and the fact that they have been sent. Um, and you, then you may also want to consider, right, how do we automate or uh, reporting and how do we get the data out to folks, right? I think that an important piece of this, this entire conversation regarding data and supervision is transparency, right? So as a supervisor of a legal unit, um, if this is something that I'm addressing with my team at our regular case acceptance meeting, right, I want to be able to share out the aggregate data about how our team is doing as far as our goals or outcomes or closing cases this month, or it's the end of the year, how many cases do we have to close before the end of the year, right? So making sure that, that we figure out either some way to 
uh, automate or display the information so that it's um, so that we're transparent and it's regularly available. Yeah, and, and along that line, the, earlier I was speaking about uh, sort of the divide between tech administration and, and legal work. Uh, and I think you sort of see that a little bit between legal work and sort of grant management or reporting. Uh, and I think this is another way to bridge that gap because, you know, ultimately all three of these things need to work in concert with each other. So, you know, as a case handler, it, you know, ultimately our, our number one, the number one obligation is to provide uh, excellent legal work. Um, but having information about the work that's happening in as close to real time is going to be informative in terms of how you handled that, let's say, case acceptance meeting or planning meeting or supervision, you know, check-in meeting, right? Uh, so I think getting some of these, all of these systems in place that Anna's talking about are sort of a baseline to understanding what's going on. And so I wanted to, today I really want to address some of the kind of low-hanging fruit in our case management systems as far as data goes, um, right? Like we all have some sort of timekeeping or activities or notes that there's something happening on a case, right? Most, if not all systems have open and closed dates for cases, right? Types of cases are your problem code. Uh, cases have people who are assigned to them as a handler, right? Um, there are many different ways to track this, but cases have outcomes, levels of service, close reasons, case goals, right? So what happened as a result of this case or is expected to happen as a result of this case? Funding codes, uh, what practice group or unit or office that case is assigned to, right? There's nothing special or crazy about this list, right? This is a very, very standard list of uh, data points that are available in a case management system, again, whether you're using access or a full-fledged um, kind of enterprise level case management system, right? This data is most likely available to you. So I wanted to kind of walk uh, through some examples on what we can use uh, this data for. Uh, and before we switch to the next one, uh, yep. the, to sort of un emphasize or piggyback on that point, I think when we're talking about sort of our our, our history of data, because this is where sort of I got interested in this initially, was that, you know, I would know that we have, you know, years and years worth of records about cases, but I knew very little about like what we could glean from that. And so what I think is interesting here is it's a, just a reminder that you don't need like detailed time notes and timekeeping notes on every single case to start to learn about uh, what has happened and what you could improve on or what you're doing really well because um, all of these data points can help are ways that you can slice and dice the data to help you understand a little bit better what's going on and so just as a so all of the data that you'll see here is all made up i didn't pull these from anything in particular i messed around with some numbers in excel so just wanted to throw that out there um, so again, starting with the basics, right? Most of us on this, uh, in this training today have probably done something similar, right, to this. In a given time period, how many cases have we closed in each of the standard legal problem code categories, right? This is not crazy. This is not innovative. This is not, uh, should not be shocking to folks. But, right, have we used this as a supervision tool? Right. Have we looked at this data in the context of supervision? Right. Obviously, we've reported it to our funders, and um, hopefully, we're using it for priority setting as well. But how, to what extent have we looked at that basic data that we're collecting regularly to um, to figure out how we're meeting those goals? What uh, and what some of the trends are in the way that our staff is closing cases or opening cases or doing intakes? Um, Right, the fact that in this example that we're closing more housing cases than anything else, how does that line up with the funding that we have? Right, how does that line up with the size of our housing unit? Or was this just a particular month where there were a lot of housing counsel and advice cases that got open and closed real quickly? Right, so again, back to the point that both Darius and I were making earlier, right, this single chart is not the end-all be-all, 
but it points us in the right direction of other places that we might want to go as supervisors to investigate what's going on further. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's imp it's it's all about context. So uh, you know, this is obviously a pretend data set, but it's not it's not crazy. Um, and if you worked in an organization that had you know this sort of outcomes closing cases, what it really does is it starts pointing towards the question. So just sort of quickly looking at it, you would think, right, we have more housing cases than than other cases. Why is that, right? Is it because of our funding, like Anna mentioned? Is it because you know, administratively, somebody in the housing unit decided to close all of their cases just now, uh, you know, or is it because that's what, uh, you know, we have, that's that's how our cases are designed. You know, there's all sorts of factors. And I think this is what you start to see when you look at data is that it's just, it's it points you in directions. It doesn't, unless you do some next level analysis, we don't really know what's happening from looking at this data set, but we know the questions we should be asking. And if we're, um, oriented in our organization, uh, we know what to expect. So if we're expecting to see a bunch of housing cases, uh, that's a good thing. If we're not, now we know, all right, we should be asking some questions. What's going on? No matter what. And, you know, this sort of report, it's very basic, easy to run, uh, easy to get your hands on. It's probably something that people should be reviewing periodically, right? For this, for, you know, these exact reasons that you might have something out of the ordinary that might point you in the direction of uh, something really great happening, something undesirable happening, who knows? So uh, I think for all of these, you can sort of do these little exercises, like what what would you start thinking about when you see this? Yeah, and so the next three slides here are all addressing the same uh, issue, right? Again, nothing is kind of crazy here. So we have our close reasons for a case or level of service, um, whatever your program calls it, right, from counsel and advice to ex extensive service. And again, that that case type, right? So, you know, any of our family law attorneys on the call, it's no surprise that extended service family law cases are, um, there's a lot of time being put into those, right? Um, but again, kind of aligning that back with um, our individual goals. And if we look at the next one here, uh, breaking this down a little bit more, right, because on that last graph, the counsel and advice bars were getting dwarfed. So if we look at our just counsel and advice cases, right, what is the average number of hours that our team is spending on counsel and advice cases? And in this particular one, right, we see that education is a little bit of an outlier. And Again, that could be for a number of reasons, right? We could have an education advocate who um, spends a lot of time really getting to know the clients and on the phone with the clients, even though it's a counsel and advice case, right? We could have an, an education advocate who may not necessarily be um, overly familiar with those closing codes, so has been closing something as a counsel and advice, which may have been supposed to be brief service, right? So again, just a uh, quick snapshot of something as basic as how, what is the average number of hours that our advocates are spending on these types of cases um, can help make that judgment. Yeah, and uh, you know, when I look at this, I think it's 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 all about those questions that it, it, it makes you ask, right? To, to yeah. emphasize the point from earlier, which is just, you know, you know, again, if you're oriented in an organization and you know, okay, our education, cases, you know, that's the, that is how they work, then that makes sense. And if not, you know, you start going through your sort of list of questions that it would have you ask. Yep. And the same with the, with the next one as well. This yeah, is sorry. just, this is just only your um, extended service cases, right? So then again, gives you a good idea of where things are at with extended service cases. And um again, also allows you to continue to acknowledge the good work that the people you supervise are doing, right? Like, and uh, making sure that they, because that's, you know, one of the many things um, that's important about being a supervisor is making sure that, you know, people know that the work that they're doing is appreciated and it's good work, right? Especially in um, the the field that, that you're all in, right? So I think that, um, and just being able to continue to reflect that is important. Yeah, I also think um, 
that in in a rubric or a, a report sorry like this um this is where you really need to look at like your program priorities and your funding right so let's just go with the assumption that uh i don't think the family law case would be quite that long but let's just go with the assumption that you're spending a you know inordinately long amount or a high amount of time on contested family law cases so then you're gonna then i think it's you know, the exercise is to go back and look at like, okay, is that the plan, right? Or is that straining our, our organizational resources or, or, my, or the staff members that we supervise? Is it straining them, right? Is, did we plan on this, right? So if we know that uh, we're spending a lot of time on these types of cases, like, did we plan on that? And if not, how can we make those adjustments? Um, and that's the sort of supervision that really needs to start happening uh, and we have that data. So that's what's sort of the exciting idea about it is that we can start looking at it. And we can say like, oh, okay, I know that this one case and that's why this data is so high. Uh, and so we can filter it a little bit, right? You could throw out, you know, if you do some more statistical analysis, you can start to uh, adjust those numbers a little bit to get a, a sense of like what, what is normal versus what's an outlier. But if you do notice, you know, once you've done that sort of either common sense filtering or you've done some actual statistical analysis, um, now's the time for action, right? If you're noticing something isn't consistent, uh, this is the time to start thinking about what changes need to make, be made or what changes can be made. Now, I know that uh, as a case handler, on the case handler side, uh, you have an obligation on a case, right? You can't just say, well, we're spending too much time on it, so we can't do it. So we have to be aware that like uh, adjustments on on the work that we're doing based on like the data we're seeing aren't necessarily going to show up in real time. We can't just drop cases, but we can start to make those like programmatic uh, changes to 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 push it towards where we need to go. Um, but you know the reality is there's always going to be uh, the case or the situation that throws all this out the window. But part of it is planning for it. So the next one as far as kind of low-hanging fruit for um, data points that are easily accessible, um, we've got an average number of hours on a closed case with a particular type of outcome, right? So in this given, in this report, we can see how much time, right? So you could do an average or you could do a total, right? How much time are our case handlers spending preventing eviction? How much time are our case handlers spending uh, getting people through bankruptcy, right? And again, just two uh, very, very common, very easily accessible data points that, um, that you can use to match those priorities. And, oh, do you have anything Excellent. else on that? Okay, yeah. No. And then, so, <clears throat> away from cases, right? Uh, so, we do our case reviews with our unit, right? We talk to folks about um, how the cases are doing, what the different statuses of the cases are, and kind of can look at some of the, the data that we, I just kind of went through. But then uh, the next kind of place where we can look at uh, someone's timekeeping and activities, right? So again, really accessible data, right? How many hours someone worked in a given week or pay period, right? And what types of time they logged. And this can give us, a, as supervisors, right, this can give us a bunch of insight because if somebody is a full-time case handler, right, should they be spending half their time on supporting activity rather than cases, right? It's at least worth a conversation, right? They could actually be spending that time on cases, but maybe they're not the most contemporaneous of timekeepers, so they do a lot of bulk time in supporting activities just to make sure that everything gets in. Right, but this at least is a quick snapshot of a time distribution of how it's all um, laid out. And again, uh, regardless of what case management system you have, right, maybe you can do uh, develop um, reports and charts and tables within your case management system, right? Maybe you have to export it out and use Excel or Crystal Reports or another tool to actually manipulate and build out the data. But being able to create these um, little kind of snapshots um, can be really useful. And I wanted to just use this one as an example of kind of taking it beyond the, the cases and looking at 
at um, how people are using their time internally. Yeah, and I think that this is also uh, an opportunity to go back to the organizational obligation um, where, you know, I think there can be some conversations about what expectations are, right? So uh, I think in a perfect world, everybody's reporting, you know, all of their case time. But what we maybe don't always articulate is like, what is the expected sort of ratio of, of supporting time and case time? And obviously leave time is prescribed. Um, what are our expectations? And what's reasonable, right? So uh, I think as an, at an, on the administrative level, you'd love to have like people on 100% of case time, but like that's just not really realistic. People have to like, you know, get up and get something to drink, whatever. Uh, and so you start to have percentage loss on your time. I think there's an opportunity here to have like, to be realistic about it and sort of set goals and objectives in terms of like, what do we wanna be measuring how do we want people to put in their time? You, you know, we're not, we know we're not going to capture everything. We know sometimes something gets underreported, overreported. What's reasonable? What do we, what, what do we sort of expect from the sort of average staff member? And what do we know are the, like the deviations? What do we know are the reasons for that? And then when we, so if you have that as an organizational uh, priority, and I'm not saying anything hard, or fast on it, then you can start to sort of uh, have objectives around that. So I think it's a good uh, an easy report to take a look at. And so for the next one, kind of along those similar lines, right, as a supervisor of a legal unit, right, you probably have some sort of meeting where you're deciding uh, what cases um, are going to be taken and what level of service are going to be provided and who's going to be taking those cases. Right. Some uh, organizations have uh, just kind of a rotating wheel of folks who take the next kind of major uh, case that would involve litigation. Right. Some organizations have uh, kind of complex formulas that they use to assign cases. But all of that just starts with knowing what the caseload of your team looks like. Right. And so, again, something that is really accessible and really easy to get out of your case management system, right? What does everybody's caseload look like right now? How many open and active cases do they have? And then taking that to the next level and looking at, okay, well, let's break that down between brief service or counsel and advice and extended service cases, because that can give us an even better idea of where we're at. And um, what you could potentially even do with this is with, um, some manipulation in Excel or with some very, very lightweight Python scripting, right? You could build those, um, those formulas and how you assign cases into some sort of very basic tool or Excel, right? Where you could say, okay, look at the number, you know, you put your, your data into Excel or into another tool, right? look at how many extended service cases this person has, look at the last time they did major, major litigation and look at their calendar for availability and then, and then decide what you're doing with this case, right? So all of that fun automation is possible um, and isn't that big of a lift. Um, if you kind of have some either uh, mid-level Excel skills or some basic programming skills. Um, but again, right, that all starts with the the raw easily accessible data and i think this is a tremendous opportunity for uh sort of active supervision so i think depending on your program priorities and how you assign cases um i i see the role of a supervisor as sort of being a, a gatekeeper here and so if you have the knowledge about what people what types of cases we have so right here the case acceptance and also the information like the other previous slides, um, I sort of know from personal experience, I would have certain staff members that I worked with who uh, just like had it ingrained in them that they wanted to help people. So if they were, you know, meeting with people that day, they would come out with, you know, a higher number of cases that they, you know, absolutely wanted to have opened versus another staff member who maybe, uh, you know, just has a different approach to it. I'm not saying one is right or wrong, 
but uh, you could then end up with a disproportionate amount of cases being assigned to somebody because they just feel really passionate about it. And part of what we needed to do and what I would do uh, if I, when I had this type of information is I can look at it and I can say, okay, well, I, this is what I know about your current caseload. And, you know, the, to go back way back to the beginning in terms of ethical obligations, like you want to make sure people aren't overburdened, right? They have to be able to, you know, effectively handle their cases. So we can't always say yes. And as, as a supervisor, you have to use this information to sort of help you be the, the person who says no to a case or no to an assignment or a special project because we have to, you know, our, our, what I would say is our ongoing obligation is to our existing clients, right? We have to provide the best level of service that we can and to meet our, our obligations. So this is the sort of information that you should uh, be providing to supervisors and supervisors should be reviewing to help them make that decision. Uh, when they're deciding, to, you know, where a case goes or how you reassign cases, uh, it's really important, and it, or maybe the most important thing beyond just all the other sort of like day-to-day uh, -day things. But in terms of like programmatically, I think it can make a huge difference. And sometimes it just ends up happening organically, which can sort of be like a personality-driven process, um, and isn't as friendly to these charts. And so the last one here is kind of that taking it to the next level um, that we were both kind of referencing. And so this is uh, a screenshot out of Legal Server's um, help documentation on their forecasting tools. And so what they have done, right, is they've taken some of the guesswork and need for um, more sophisticated data work out of the hands of our supervisors, right, and then and created tools within the case management system that help us figure out kind of where we're at in a particular case and how it's and how it's working. Um, so this particular example, right, is looking at how this particular set of cases stacks up to similar cases as far as the number of hours that have been spent. Um, so again, kind of taking it past to that next level, past that like standard kind of, you know, this is the information, right, manipulating that information and working with it, right. So um, fortunately, Legal Server has these uh, tools built in. Um, feel free to reach out to them if you have any questions or uh, want to get a little bit more information about that. They also have documentation on their help site about their new forecasting tools. Um, right, because not all of us are lucky enough to have data analysts or data scientists on our team. Um, and while I definitely would say that it's not a requirement to have folk, data folks on your team, um, it can definitely be uh, useful to um, talk to some or contract with one for a or for a you know discrete research project um, and kind of and kind of look through your data quality and what you can do with your data and getting information out of it and doing cool uh, things like the the forecasting here. Yeah, the last thing I'd say on the on the data is is I know you know everyone has got different sort of setups, uh, different programs and different sort of capabilities of their case management systems or data databases. But, and, and some of the refrains that I've heard when I've had these conversations is just that like the data is not good enough. Uh, and I think it's important to just remember the point that we've made earlier that like there is, it's not just a matter of uh, certain, ha whether or not you have time entries, right? There's other ways we can pull it out. And the other thing is you can, you can also like apply some sort of, again, common sense filters, right? Okay, we think historically we've, you know, under captured time. So we really want to know case time. You know, let's assume 20% under reporting. What does that look like? What do our hours look like then, right? You can do some real basic manipulation of that data that might start to like, uh, I always think about like, does it, when you look at it, does it make sense, right? And so if you play with that a little bit, you can start to see, you know, you can make some assumptions and see what might make sense in that. And then it, you know, it, then it becomes another piece of the puzzle. It's not an answer; it's just a piece. Uh, next. One. Yeah. So outside of our Sorry. case management, so outside of our case management system, right? There's places that we can go to start building um, out the data more, right? So we have our case management system data right now. What additional information can we layer in with that to tell us an even better story and to paint an even better picture of how folks are getting their work done? 
right? Uh, many phone systems include uh, pretty sophisticated call logs, right? So you can look to see how long people are on the phone, right? We're not looking at, at listening in, right? We're not looking at um, like tracking who they're calling, right? Just simply like how long is it, does it take this person to make an intake call, right? Um, and comparing that back with some of the data that we're collecting from the case management system. And the same thing applies for uh, text messaging, right? If you're text messaging through your case management system or through some other tool, right, you have that data available to you in aggregate so you can look at how folks are using it and layer it into that case management system. And if you're not um, using your case management system or another kind of enterprise level text messaging tool, um, you should definitely consider doing it just simply for the quality assurance for building that case record and for the data that's available. And in, oh, did you oh, have some data? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it just reminds me that when I was supervising, I, I had one staff member where uh, their, their, like the call time, because you could see how long people were on the phone, they were just like the front desk in that person. And they got amazing results. So like, they were doing something really effective, uh, but it always jumped out at me. Like the amount of time on the phone was so disproportionate to everything. So I guess my point is like, it's not a good or a bad fact, but you got to look at it in context and you can get some interesting information there. Yeah, definitely. And kind of the final place that we can look at is our document storage and our document management, right? To layer in with both of our communication logs and the information that we're getting from our case management system. So not only do we want to make sure that people are complying with our existing policies, right? That they're supposed to be putting their case related documents in a shared workspace as opposed to a private folder on their desktop, right? Um, we can look at the content generally, right? Look at the contents of the folder, right? Not what's in there, but how much is in there, right? Uh, SharePoint box and Google drive all have different kind of reporting levels as far as that goes to see, uh, what the makeup is of directories, so how many um, files are in those directories and how often they're accessed and things like that. Um, again, all to different degrees. Um, but it can, again, that can be a really interesting uh, set of uh, tools and data that's available for creating that kind of full supervision picture. And so before we kind of get into some of the some other pieces, right, just to kind of highlight some of the tools that I've talked about or the, uh, in this section that you may want to look at more. Uh, Tableau and Power BI are both kind of uh, big data analysis and business analytics tools, uh, both of which uh, are can be highly discounted uh, through TechSoup, or at least for at one point, and I believe Power BI um, may, at one point it was also free. I'm not sure if it still is for nonprofits, at least their um, basic version. Uh, legal server I discussed, Salesforce, uh, another uh, platform that can be used for case management that has kind of strong um, data and dashboarding tools built in it for that transparency, and uh, SharePoint as well. Um, so once we have all of this data, right, and once we're kind of working with this data, we can really use this data to kind of create a uh, more positive work environment, and um, I'll let Darius talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Anna. So um, I think that first part of this conversation is like getting the picture, right? Starting to fill out what we think we know about the work that's happening in our organization. Um, and then the next piece is like um, trying to implement it, right? So better data can help us supervise differently, right? We can look at what we have done in the past, right? Because data is a capturing you know, past activities. Um, but now we need to sort of come up with a way to implement that, to plan for it. Uh, so we can use that information and the, and the directions that it gives us to improve our supervision and address sort of real time issues and make changes. So one of the things that I think we can do differently with better information about what folks are doing is uh, improve supervision uh, in sort of non-conventional supervision relationships. I think traditionally we're thinking about, I'm in one office, you're in the office down the hall, I go talk to you. So, you know, the need for data is, is helpful, but like 
you know, I, I don't necessarily need it all the time. I could just go talk to you. I think that is always going to be true to an extent, but the, I think also the reality is um, as supervisors and staff members, uh, we're really pulled in a lot of directions. And so we need to be thinking about supervising differently. So, you know, it could be, it's not just like remote supervision. I think there are, there is a, a lot of organizations I know are looking at remote policies, but I also think it's about uh, thinking about supervisors who uh, are staff members that work in other offices, that circuit ride, that are in the field, or, you know, people who are just at court all the time, or, you know, meeting with clients all the time. You know, it's, it's often the case. You could be in an office with one person, and because of the nature of the work that's going on, you might never see them. So, I think it's important to start thinking about the technology tools that we have available and how we can deploy them to help keep those communi communication uh, channels open. And, oh, sorry, Anna, did you have anything to add to that, Anna? Nope. Oh, okay, good. Um, so at the same time, you know, in these sort of changing supervision landscapes, we do have these challenges, right? How do you know folks are really working and how do we balance that, right? How do we do that without micromanaging? Uh, and how do we make sure people are sort of working in the best collaborative way? You know, I think this entire conversation uh, is a balancing act. And I said this earlier, right? We don't want to micromanage people. Uh, everybody's different. Everybody has different habits. What worked for me, you know, I, I didn't, you know, the person I, the person I supervised and I talked about earlier was on the phone all the time. That's not, that's not my style, but it worked really well for them, right? So we, it doesn't, it's not apples to apples, but we can, we can put in some tools to help us understand uh, what's going on and have people be on the same page. So, you know, to so do that. question here related yeah, to the ahead. challenges. Um, when you're putting in place a new telephone system, uh, or something that is going to collect a lot more data. Um, how do you really set that up to be successful from a change uh, management perspective um, so that your staff doesn't feel like you are becoming part of a surveillance group on them? Like, how do you do that effectively? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and so I, I think part of it is just having a sort of open uh, conversation about what we're trying to do right, and what the objective is. And I think it's about framing as much of, as we can, framing these conversations uh, in terms of like uh, better outcomes for our clients um, and not micromanaging and really acknowledging that like uh, what I said earlier, you know, that it's not apples to apples. What worked for one person doesn't necessarily work for another person. You really, really don't want to get into the world of like policing individual work styles. I mean, that's that sounds nightmarish. That's not supervision. That's not good supervision at all, right? You know, there has to be room for for individuality. I think there has to be acknowledgement uh, in the legal environment that there's a there's a an art to it. It's not a science. There's not it's not input A and B. It, you know, there's an alchemy to it. So I think acknowledging that off the top is is important. Um, but, you know, I think there is going to have to be that little bit of that reconciliation between, you know, maybe just making people aware that that is happening. I think that's important. You know, you don't want people to be surprised after implementation that people have a different set of data. Um, Anna, any other thoughts on that? Well, and I think, and just setting the boundaries too, right? Like this is the data that we have and this is what we're not going to be doing. Right, like we are not going to be popping into your phone calls unexpected, right? We are not going to be reviewing transcripts of your phone calls, right? Like this is strictly for, to be used for X, Y, and Z reason. And at any point, if you're interested, like you can request to see it. Like you can request to see the, the data that we, that we have. And just, you know, in making sure to have like any technology implementation that you're getting a good spread of people in the room to make to make the policies and have the discussions around this, around the, the implementation. Yeah, I think you've got two really good points there. Make sure that the individuals that are going to be using the new technology are directly involved in the implementation and planning and then transparency, definitely. Yeah, thanks, Art. 
So I think in terms of, uh, and this actually segues nicely, uh, in terms of setting expectations, right? I think we need to, when we talk about this is not a gotcha practice, right? This is about like saying, whether it be it's the data or the tools that we use, it's when you onboard staff members or you implement that new technology, you sit down and you incorporate it into the work that you do. And you say, this is how we want to see you using this. And, you know, it's a collaborative discussion. This is what we know about the casework we do. This is what we know about these systems. And uh, this is how we want to use it. And I think that conversation needs to happen, not like once you've collected the data and you want to tell people what they have to change, but like as you're, as you're implementing it. So um, I guess I sort of stepped on this, <laughs> on this slide, sorry. Uh, so we have to incorporate that data. We want to be very specific in these work plans. Uh, we want to include or reference like the right protocols and uh, steps that people should be taking. And uh, in a supervision relationship, organizationally or one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we want to regularly update these plans. So it's not enough that you know, every five years we overhaul our plan to update new technologies or new data that we have or incorporate this or that. It, it needs to sort of be an organic process that's reviewed regularly and that, that needs to be part of like an organizational uh, priority. Otherwise it doesn't happen, right? You get it, it happens once, people sort of pay attention and then there's attrition after that. And that's almost worse than doing it at all in, in my view. So in, when we talk about like the tools that we can use, especially when people are in the field or not like right in the office next to you, um, these are some of the, the tools that we see folks using. Um, so I'm sort of talk about it uh, sort of specifically, but one of the, the advantages I, I see and that uh, Ann and I see for our clients is that uh, there's, there's a lot of emails that people get during the day and it becomes like the, the one place that people communicate about everything. And it can be very difficult, especially if you're busy and you're not just sitting at your desk reading your email all day, it can be difficult to filter through those in a way that effectively identifies what's, you know, an announcement about somebody's birthday and what's like an emergency, right? Because it's just that they're all sort of buried in there. You can do some stuff with priorities or folders or filters, but like it's not the slickest solution. Having said that, uh, looking at this list, you probably don't want to implement every single technology at once to help address these because that's going to be just as confusing as a really, really cluttered uh, email box. So um, one of the things that we've seen is moving to some chat applications, whether it's Slack or Microsoft Teams, where people can have dedicated channels for those communications. And that can help cut down on sort of trivial uh, communication chatter uh, and it'll be it's sort of more of a opt-in situation where people can go access it when they need it uh, and of course the way all of these tools are leveraged is dependent on how folks and how organizations set those priorities right so it, again it's about setting the expectations you know if we decide to, that we're going to use slack in an organization we need to tell people when they should be using slack and how they should be using it it's not just that we have it Right? When should I be sending an email? What sort of communication should be in a Slack reference? You know, what, how should I use, like I showed up here, these uh, different icons? Uh, there's all sort of ways that we can think about it, but it needs to be inclusive of your entire staff because you're going to have better uh, results and it needs to be communicated clearly. Anything to add on that, Anna? No, I don't think so. I think just one really kind of creative use that I've seen of um, Slack or kind of or that similar kind of messaging is uh, there's a small or there's a software company called Glitch, and they are very transparent about their um, policies, which is why I've seen this. And um, what they do is they have a designated Slack channel where you like check in and check out. So if you go into the day, you like drop in a custom emoji that you're in. And then when you leave, you drop in a custom emoji that you're out. And I think that's a really like cool, fun way to say like, yes, I'm here, I'm available to chat. Or like, no, I, I'm out of the office or I'm at court or something, right? And so using, th thinking of kind of creative ways to use these tools um, to even simply indicate like, 
yes, I'm here, I'm at my desk, I'm working, and I'm ready for you to contact me, right? Which is is half the battle sometimes in as far as remote supervision goes. Yeah, and especially as a supervisor, because you know we didn't talk about this. Well, maybe a little bit at the beginning, but like if you have your own cases, you have a trial, like you may not be available, and your staff might not know. So having some channels where you can communicate that sort of information is is good. Um, so briefly, tools that we've seen uh, deployed in this manner, you know, different chat applications, Teams, Google Hangouts, Skype, Zoom, all have been used. I, I should have done go-to meetings. I'm sorry, sir. Um, the, uh, let's see, uh, different project management tools. I think the key thing here, and I, I touched on it earlier, uh, and Anna and I get a kick out of this, is we don't want to do it all at once, right? Like just pick some of these tools and implement them. You know, they're not, one of them or all of them is not, are not going to solve all your problems and they're probably just going to create more. Um, any, any other so, comments on this one? So if you were going to jump in and just uh, try two of those tools in an organization that really doesn't use any of these, what two would each of you recommend? So uh. I would say I, I really like, well, I like Slack a lot, but if you are using Office 365, Teams is a pretty good solution because you can do those sort of side conversations. You could have dedicated sort of like practice group conversations. You can have one-on-one -on -one conversations. You can do video conferencing. It's all sort of built in there, and you can access SharePoint uh, and documents through it. Like you can share them, interact with them. So I really think that would be a good answer, and that kind of goes with SharePoint. Skype, uh, I think Skype for Business is going away soon. So you know, I know a lot of folks uses, use it, but it's, they say it's going to get phased out. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. I guess that would be my answer, Anna. I agree with Teams, and then looking at the integrations that are available in Teams. So you know, I imagine that a number of folks on this call are Microsoft Shops, uh, Teams is included with most 365 um, or with uh, a set of 365 implementations and then looking at other integrations. So uh, Microsoft has its own version of Trello called Planner where it's like the Kanban style board of, of cards for task management. You know, you can integrate your OneNote into Teams for note taking and everything like that and it becomes a really um, it can be a really streamlined way to manage that. I do definitely recommend if you are want to, wanting to experimenting, experiment with it, pull together a pilot group or start with like one of your practice area units and um, like work through uh, what some best practices are and how you want it to be used because it can be a little bit of a bear. Um, yeah. And there's a lot, of, a lot of different features and a lot of different components. Um, so definitely kind of pick a pilot group to work through it and identify what some of the priorities should be for uh, folks. All right. All right. <laughs> and Anna's dog also agrees. Um, final thought. So I, I think I said this earlier, but like, I, and this, this goes to that communication piece that Sartre sort of asked about is, look, these are, are tools to help us do our jobs better, right? They are not going to replace the work we do. They're not going to replace the individual qualities that uh, staff members have, and and you shouldn't, right? That's not the point. Uh, we want to sort of maintain this healthy balance between not being a surveillance organization uh, at all, but still, like you know, I think we there is room to dig a little bit deeper and you know be a little bit more uh, thoughtful in how we implement and collect information to help everyone you know maintain that healthy balance uh, and then you know continue to look at you know how tools are changing how data is changing uh, to make sure we're innovating and, and we're doing the best work do and any other thoughts uh no, uh, I, I think, think that's great. Oh, go ahead. Nope, I think that, right. that was a great way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank uh, thank you, Just Tech, for putting this together. Um, as a reminder, the recording for this will be available on our YouTube channel here within a few days. 
Uh, we've got three more webinars coming up through the end of the year. They can be found at lsntap.org slash events. Um, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.